This required practical is split into two uh, activities. Both of them are going to be investigating the same thing. They're going to be investigating the effect of changing concentration on the rate of reaction. Now, I'm not going to go through the full required practical here. I'm just going to show you the method, um, and then you should know that if you just repeated that method with different concentrations, then you would be able to, uh, to see the effect. I will give you some data at the end of this so that you can have a results table, you can calculate the average and you can plot a graph and then you can see the trend. Um, but there's no point in me repeating it over and over in this video because it will be the same method um, just with different concentrations. So this is the, the first one. This is uh, using the disappearing cross. This is called the disappearing cross reaction. And this is uh, a method that we use in a reaction where we have a distinct color change. Most commonly, the reaction of thiosulfate with hydrochloric acid. Now, you don't need to know this equation. If they ever ask you to talk about it, it will be provided for you. But you do need to be aware of this reaction. You should know that when you react thiosulfate with hydrochloric acid, it produces solid sulfur, solid insoluble sulfur. So it's going to go from a, a, an aqueous solution to a very, very cloudy, sort of yellow um, because the sulfur is insoluble. So what all we do is we add the hydrochloric acid and the sodium thiosulfate together and we time how long it takes until we can't see that cross anymore that I've put on the paper. Okay, it's very low tech, but it's very effective. So the method is simple. Okay, if we look at the diagram, anytime you see this image, this should set up alarm bells. This is the disappearing cross reaction. So I'm going to add my thiosulfate first. Okay, and you can notice that you can still see the cross. Okay. And I'm going to add my hydrochloric acid second. And as soon as I've added it, I'm going to start that timer. So in it goes, start the timer, give it a little swirl, and then we're just going to keep an eye on that until we can no longer see the cross. So in this reaction, because we're getting this solid sulfur being produced, it's going to turn a very sort of cloudy yellow colour. And as soon as that uh, enough sulfur has been produced, we will no longer be able to see that cross. Now, in terms of the actual method here, it is that simple. You add your thiosulfate, then you add your hydrochloric acid and start the timer at the exact moment that you've added the second rea uh, reactant. And I would say, looking at that, that cross has disappeared. So I would now stop the timer. It took 45 seconds. I would then rinse this out and repeat the entire method using a different concentration. Now, in this activity, you're using different concentrations of the thiosulfate. But actually, there's nothing stopping you differing the concentration of the hydrochloric acid. What is important is that everything else remains the same. So, I used 25 centimetres cubed of hydrochloric acid. I used 25 centimetres cubed of sodium thiosulfate. It's important that we use the exact same measurements both times. If I'm going to repeat this again, I need to use the exact same amounts. I used 0.1 mole per decimeter cubed hydrochloric acid. Next time I do this, I need to use the same concentration of acid. You should only ever be varying one thing. You only have one independent variable. In this example, in this practical, we are varying the concentration of the thiosulfate. So I would repeat the experiment again using the same volume of both, using the same concentration of the hydrochloric acid, but varying the concentration of the thiosulfate. And we'll start to see uh, what effect that has on the rate of reaction. So that's the disappearing cross reaction. It's a nice, simple, easy reaction. Um, and you can see that's got this nice cloudy colour. In terms of what you need to do, now I've uh, uploaded a copy of this for you to uh, print. And then on the back here, again, you will have a copy of this. Don't feel like you have to scribble it down from the video. Um, some results. Okay, so these are the results of the experiment that I did this morning. What I want you to do 
is to calculate a mean value for each concentration of sodium thiosulfate. So we can see very clearly here that as the concentration of thiosulfate is increasing from 8 grams per decimeter cubed to 40 grams per decimeter cubed, the time taken is very clearly decreasing. It's going faster. The rate is increasing. So what I want you to do is to calculate the mean okay, of these values and then plot that as a graph with a smooth, continuous line of best fit. Now that line of best fit and that graph should look a lot like this. And again, um, there will be a worksheet attached to this assignment that will have some um, graph paper on there as well so that you can plot this graph. Okay, it's really important that in the rates of reaction topic that we are really on top of plotting graphs. They're usually worth three or four marks and relatively speaking, they should be three or four very easy marks as long as we practice. Okay, so make sure we're using a pencil, okay, that we are double checking our plots, we are making sure our scales are continuous intervals, so they're going up by the same amount each time, that they're using a suitable amount of the graph paper, that our plots are accurately plotted, and that we have a nice smooth continuous line of best fit. So this worksheet will be uploaded to the assignment so you can print it out, you can fill in the results table and you can plot the graph. Okay, this is activity two from the uh, rate of reaction required practical and again we're looking at the exact same thing, we're looking at the effect of varying concentration on the rate of a reaction. Now we have a very different reaction here uh, what we are looking at is the reaction between magnesium ribbon and hydrochloric acid. Okay, so the reaction we're going to be looking at we're going to have magnesium plus hydrochloric acid, which is going to produce magnesium chloride and hydrogen gas. So solid magnesium, aqueous hydrochloric acid forming aqueous magnesium chloride and hydrogen gas. So in this reaction we are going to look at the gas being produced. Okay, We're going to collect the gas being produced over time and use that to determine the effect of change in concentration on the rate. So again, just like before, I'm going to just run through the method once and then you know, obviously you would just repeat that. Exactly the same, exact same measurements, keep all the control variables the same just varying the concentration of the hydrochloric acid. So what we have here, if you look at the diagram, we have our conical flask and it's important when we're dealing with um, gases, volumes of gases, that we use a vessel that allows us to put a bung in the top. If I was using a beaker, I would not be able to put a bung at the top and I wouldn't be able to prevent the gas from being lost. So if we're dealing with collection of gases, it's important that we're using a vessel that allows us to put a bung in the top. So a conical flask, a boiling tube, a test tube, something like that. And what we have is a trough of water with an inverted measuring cylinder, which is precisely what I have over here. Okay, so I've got my measuring cylinder here, filled with water, sat in a trough of water. So an alternative to this setup would be to use a gas syringe, okay, which is going to be a little bit more precise. But this works just perfectly for what we want to do. So what we're going to do here, so I've got my conical flask with my magnesium ribbon in there. I'm sure you can see it at the bottom all cut up. It's important that when you repeat this experiment, you use the exact same mass of magnesium ribbon. And we're going to add 50 centimetres cubed of hydrochloric acid. And as soon as I add that hydrochloric acid, the reaction is going to begin. So it's really important that I'm ready and set up because as soon as I add that hydrochloric acid, I need to start that timer and I need to get the bung on here as quickly as possible so that none of the gas is lost or as little of the gas is lost as possible. Okay, and then the gas is going to travel through this delivery tube and into this uh, measuring cylinder and we'll be able to then measure the volume of gas at timed intervals. So, let's have a go at this then. 
So I'm going to put in my try put everything as close together as possible so that I can so I'm going to get the hydrochloric acid in. Bung on, timer started, and you can see the gas being produced. Okay. Now in this experiment, you're going to be recording the volume of gas at regularly timed intervals every 10 seconds. So that was uh, 30 at 10 seconds. After 20 seconds, it is 55. After 30 seconds, it is 85. Okay. Now, And now it's reached 100, so at 40 seconds, it is at 100. So, in this experiment, you would then repeat this, wash this out, refill this with water, using the exact same mass of magnesium, but varying the concentration of the acid. So this is the one molar acid. So you could do the exact same thing using the same mass of magnesium, same volume of hydrochloric acid, but vary the concentration, perhaps use 0.5 mole per decimal cubed or use two mole per decimal cubed and you would be able to see the effect that has on the rate of reaction. So if I move that stuff out of the way, I have here some example results for two different concentrations of acid, one mole per decimal cubed and two mole per decimal cubed. What I need you to do is to copy this out again, this will be made available to you um, on the assignment, so you need to fill in the table. I want you to plot a graph, and on that graph, I want both volumes, uh, sorry, both concentrations of acid being plotted. So you're going to have your x axis is time in seconds, your y axis is volume of gas being produced, and I want you to plot both sets of data on the same graph so that you can very quickly look at them and compare them. And you will end up with a graph that looks a lot like this. Okay, so two different uh, sets of data, two lines of best fit. So here I've got my one mole per decimal cubed acid, and here I've got my two mole per decimal cubed acid. And remember that the rate of reaction on this graph is the gradient of that curve. So you can see that the gradient is steeper for the two mole per decimal cubed than it is for the one mole per decimal cubed because it's got a faster rate because it's more concentrated. And what you also need to do is to compare your results with the data collected in activity one. Okay, so the disappearing cross reaction. Both of these activities, we're varying the concentration. So look at the results for both. And what does that tell you? When we're increasing the concentration, what is that doing to the rate of reaction? And how do we know that from our results? because we're not measuring rate, are we? There, I'm measuring volume of gas. In activity one, we were measuring time taken. Neither of those things are rate. So how do we determine rate? How is the rate changing when we are changing the concentration? And then finally, explain why. Explain using kinetic theory or using collision theory, why we are observing that change in rate compared to the change in concentration. So it's really important that you are familiar with these experiments because there will be exam questions that use these as examples or use very similar, um, very similar experiments as examples in the questions. And it's really important that you are familiar with the methods. And when we write methods, it's really important that you specify actual values you know, what volume are you using? What concentration are you using? What mass are you using? There is, you don't have to memorize the, the actual measurements from this particular experiment, for example. You don't have to use, um, you don't have to specify 50 centimeters cubed of hydrochloric acid. You could say 25 or 100. It doesn't matter as long as it's a reasonable value. So make sure you're familiar with these methods so that you can write a method if you're asked to. If you're given a question saying, describe a method for determining the effect of concentration of hydrochloric acid on the rate of reaction with magnesium, you should recognize, okay, that's the required practical I've already done. I can uh, 
use that method, I can write that method and just make sure that you specify the actual measurable values. So how much, you know, what volume, what concentration, what mass, and that you specify that, I mean, just write the method as if you were doing the experiment once, and then at the end of that say, I will now repeat this method, keeping all of the measurements the same, apart from whatever your independent variable is, whatever you're investigating. In this case, we're going to repeat this and keep everything the same, apart from I'm going to vary the concentration of the hydrochloric acid. Or, if you were varying temperature perhaps, you'd say I would repeat this experiment keeping all of the measurements the same, however I would um, heat the hydrochloric acid to different temperatures before, um, before adding it to the magnesium. So there's no point saying I will keep all the measurements the same if you haven't specified what the measurements are. So make sure when you're writing methods you do specify what volume you're talking about, what concentration you're talking about, what mass you're talking about. There are no right or wrong answers there, as long as it's a reasonable number. Don't write anything crazy like 15 tonnes of magnesium, you know, 5 grams would be reasonable, 10 grams would be reasonable, 1 gram, even 50 grams isn't entirely unreasonable. It's a bit large, but as long as you specify the value and you've then said that you're going to keep that value the same when you repeat the experiment, then you're going to pick up the marks. So just to reiterate, make sure you're familiar with the methods for both of these practicals Make sure you've plotted both graphs. The graph skills are incredibly important. Don't throw away those three or four easy marks when it comes to plotting a graph. Make sure you can interpret that graph. Remember that the gradient is the rate. So if the gradient is steep, the rate is fast. If the gradient is shallow, the rate is slow. And as soon as the uh, gradient is zero, then the rate is zero, that's when the reaction has finished. So for both activities, tables completed, plotting of graphs for both activities, and then finally compare your results or the results from activity one, the disappearing cross, to this activity, the collection of gas, and then explain the findings using kinetic theory or collision theory there will be a question on the form in the assignment that allows you to answer those two questions. So all you're going to have to do is fill in the tables, plot the graphs, and then submit maybe a photograph or a scan of that work, and then you can answer these two questions on the form.